many of us ever know what it is to become the perfect version of ourselves? This is Decoding Superhuman with your host, Boomer Anderson. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Boomer Anderson, and we're back with another episode of the Decoding Superhuman podcast. Thank you so much, Superhumans, for being here today, because uh, today is one of my favorite topics. In fact, it was a pleasure to go into the world of light with today's guest. Now, you've heard a lot about blue light. You've heard a lot about why it potentially is damaging, yet we continue to consume Netflix and all these other things late into the evening. Sometimes it does keep you awake at night. Now, the reason why I wanted to have today's guest on is because he is an expert in sort of taking abstract concepts around light and deciphering them in a way that you can use in your everyday life to become more superhuman using things like light. And essentially, that's the theme of the show. You've heard that many times, bringing on experts and really deciphering pieces of information that you can use and in this case are mostly free. But Andy Mant is the founder and CEO of Blue Blocks, a company specializing in evidence-based advanced light filtering eyewear. He started Blue Blocks after becoming dissatisfied with the standards of blue light blocking glasses available. And frankly, this is one of the reasons why I reached out to him is because there is a lot of crap out there. He wanted to design lenses that match the evidence that is in the academic literature. Andy was born in the UK and moved to Australia in 2011, where his hero story kind of starts about two years later when he put on quite a bit of weight after being in Australia. He suffered from fatigue and lacked energy, but traditional dietary approaches only worked to a certain degree. Then he stumbled across the work of people like Jack Cruz and others and found light and health, which caused Andy to forge a passion and a niche for understanding all things light. Today, Andy is a leading figure in managing light and improving using that light, excuse me, to improve health and well-being. So what did we get into? Well, first we double clicked a little bit on the Jack Cruz story. How did Andy find Jack Cruz after going through things like ketosis, paleo, etc.? We talked about circadian rhythm optimization and I actually made Andy walk through step by step how he optimizes circadian rhythm and what we actually found is that 90% of it, at least in the morning and the bookends at night, you can do for free and it only requires things like sun. We talked about optimizing your environment and things you can do with water, air, etc. And the significance of really a night evening gown or sweatsuit, if you will, and how that can help you block really toxic things like blue light. And of course, we delve deep into the diva of the light world, blue light. What's funny about Andy is that he's the first guest that we've had on that actually cited a research paper as his favorite book on on high performance. So you're going to want to check out the show notes for this one and it's decodingsuperhuman.com slash blue blocks. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X. Enjoy my episode with Mr. Andy Mant. Sponsor for this episode is The Ring on My Finger. No, I'm not married yet. And frankly, before this ring, I hated wearing rings. But I must say, the guys at Aura have done a great job. The Aura Ring allows me to track all sorts of crazy things about my sleep, including my resting heart rate, my deep sleep stages, my REM sleep, etc., etc. I really enjoy the feedback, and it allows me to make lifestyle decisions to become a higher performer. Let me give you an example. So prior to getting the Aura Ring, I would fast essentially 16 hours after my last meal. It didn't matter when that last meal was. However, when I look at my resting heart rate and how that really correlates to my performance the next day, I know I want my lowest resting heart rate coming as soon as possible after going to sleep because that's when all my recovery really starts. So what did I do? Well, it allowed me to adjust really when my last meal was before going to bed. So I have my last meal now earlier in the night. I get better sleep. I get higher quality sleep. And I must say, the next day feels amazing. So if you want to check out the Aura Ring, and if you want to pick one up yourself, go to AuraRing.com. That's O-U-R-A Ring.com. Plug in the code BOOMER and you'll get $50 off your order, or 50 euros, depending on your jurisdiction. I really hope you enjoy the ring, and on with the show. (laughs) 
Sir Andy Mant, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be on. So I want to delve into a lot with you when it comes to this concept of blue light, which I know you're wearing your blue light blockers right now, but uh, I want to first go into how you approached health because health hasn't always uh, been a focus of yours. Do I have that right? Yeah, absolutely. So I started um, started my health journey probably about five or six years ago. So I um, I moved to Australia when probably I was about 26 years old, so about seven years ago. During that time, I um, really sort of gained quite a lot of weight. Um, I'm about five foot seven. I got up to about 185 pounds, which uh, really isn't uh, really isn't very good. So um, I tried a load of different dieting techniques, like um, went on the sort of low fat diet and uh, dropping calories and things like that. And my health just got really bad. And a lot of things started to happen. Like I used to get sick quite a lot. Um, couldn't exercise. Was always out of breath. Didn't have the motivation. Um, and was just really lethargic and lazy. Um, and then I, I stumbled across um, sort of a cult following, really, of dieters um, that were following something quite new at the time, um, uh, in, in t- and it was gaining quite a lot of popularity called the ketogenic diet. Um, and I started to follow those principles and, and lost lost a lot of weight. And I was quite active in the um, uh, sort of groups in in Facebook and Twitter. And one day, this um this this really oddball doctor called Jack Cruz just suddenly popped <laughs> up in this uh, in this forum and started talking to all the food people, giving them a hard time. And I was like, oh, who's who's this prick? Like, you know, first of all. And then he, he kept posting a few other things, and it kind of sparked my interest a little bit. And the reason it sparked my interest was that keto took me so far; it took a lot of the weight off me, and I felt great but my sleep still wasn't very good. And I wanted to find out why. And this guy was talking about sleep and he was, he was very much in tune with the way I think. I'm a very disruptive thinker. I like to think of things that are very, you know, outside of the box or very different and not in the mainstream to try and sort of deduce my own theories on things and my own practices. So I started to follow him for a little bit and um, really got into the whole sort of light being the driver for optimal health. So about two, three years ago, probably about three years ago now, um, I, st- I pulled a, a pair of blue light glasses off, off Amazon, um, just a cheap pair, um, popped them on, um, used to get about sort of five, six hours sleep a night, always waking up feeling tired. Um, I put these glasses on and I was like, wow, there's, there's a bit of a difference here. I'm sort of sleeping a bit better, feeling a little bit, um, a little bit better. And as, as time went on of wearing these glasses, I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm, it's an improvement to where I've been, but it's not really i don't know i don't feel optimal i felt like there was room for improvement and that sort of led me into blue blocks which we can talk about a bit later on but you know it was great to sort of start mixing with these um sort of alternative disruptive thinkers because you know it got me to a point where i realized that food really isn't the main driver of of health um there's so many different pillars to it um you know exercise um diet sleep um and then also things like you know, looking after um, your temperature in your um, environment um, and also, um, you know, sort of managing EMS and things like that as well. And, you know, it's a whole combination of these things. And we started looking, me and my partner, into the literature a lot more and, and studying these things and started to put them into practice. And literally within the space of probably about three to four weeks, I'd fully corrected my circadian rhythms with a lot of these alternative practices, which led me to really feeling the best I ever have. So in a nutshell, that's really where it began and and sort of how it started to snowball for me. Okay, so there's a lot that I can take there, right? Because if I I break that down, I love the idea of a complex systems to approach to health. That's 100% what I believe. But first I wanna, I wanna go down the, the experience with Jack Cruz, right? Because I came across Jack Cruz when he was inevitably kind of bashing some aspect of either functional medicine or something else. And when you saw that, I guess, uh, walk me through the steps uh, for the listeners out there that you took that really led to fixing that circadian rhythm. Because if we delve a little bit more into detail, like what were you doing on a daily basis? Because it's not easy to go from five to six hours of sleep or less to seven, eight. Um, and some of the people out there may not realize all the benefits of that. So do you mind just walking through that a little bit and what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. It's a good question. I think before I answer it, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what my routine was before I started to get into this um, this side of health. And it was very much stereotypical of sort of lacking energy in the morning. So it was a real struggle for me to get out of bed. Like my alarm would wake me up. I'd be groggy. I'd be switching that alarm on snooze and, and trying to stay in bed as long as possible. And 
I always used to follow the the old adage of you know you can catch up on sleep. Um, so I used to lie in <laughs> ends, yeah, till like eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock in in the afternoon, get out of bed, and then just sort of struggle to get to sleep again in the morning, sort of mope around a bit, lacking energy, motivation, um, you know, and and that was where I was at. So what I did was to correct that. Um, obviously, I got reading about this thing called a circadian rhythm. So it's Latin um, circa about the end of day. So it's about a sort of 24 hour cycle. And it's actually slightly over 24 hours, which means that every day we have to entrain our circadian clock. You can't just have a functioning circadian clock throughout your life if you change your habits and change your light and food and exercise sort of habits as well. But I'll come on to that in a little bit more. So it has to be entrained each day. So the master clock, which is your body clock, is, is located in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is sort of directly, if your listeners can see, sort of in the middle of your brain, basically. Um, and it's run by something called the pineal gland, okay? So what switches your um, uh, clock on and off is light and dark cycles, um, very simply put. So when you wake up in the morning and light hits your eyes, it starts a basically starts the clock ticking think of it as a stopwatch on 24 hours light hits the eye the clock starts ticking so if you think of it from a biological perspective and an environmental perspective um, that clock in every mammal should start ticking as the sun rises so i started to get up and watching the sunrise which you know varies in, in time so um, within three days of watching the sunrise here um, in australia it was a, a really odd thing happened and i literally didn't need my alarm every morning at the same time I just woke up and that was really really strange and anyone that knows me that's listening to this will know and from what I've just told you before I, I literally was I could never have been a morning person so this was like absolutely game-changing for me so just jumping out of bed getting out watching that sunrise it was awesome and then what I did was um, obviously delving back into all the sort of Jack Cruz teachings, um, Bill Lagacos, um, follow him quite extensively as well. Very good on circadian bars. That's great. He used to talk um, quite a lot about blocking blue light as well um, after dark. And, you know, I was starting then to think ancestrally and I was starting to think, well, actually, yeah, our ancestors would not have been exposed to this color of light um, after dark. You know, they would have been maybe sat around the campfire after dark, which are oranges and reds and maybe a bit of yellow light in there as well. But they weren't subjected to these intense blue and, and green frequencies and then when I started to research light and the different frequencies I found that blue light raises a hormone called cortisol in, in you so a lot of people know that as the stress hormone but first thing in the morning when you see the sunrise this is a fantastic thing because you know it's absolutely like making you feel alert and awake and giving you that sort of you know jump start in the morning that you need but when you're exposed to this blue light after dark your cortisol levels are remaining chronically high. It's causing anxiety, something I suffered from before I discovered blocking blue light. Um, and also it has a, because it tells your um, central clock that it's the daytime, we're then exposing ourselves to it after dark. So with the presence of blue light after dark, our brain is thinking, oh, it's daytime, just release cortisol. Um, and it actually suppresses another hormone that's supposed to be released after dark called melatonin. And when the, the blue light and green light is present and you're not blocking it, you're um, not secreting this melatonin. So you're not actually preparing the body for relaxation and for growth and repair when you sleep. So um, wearing actually blue light blocking glasses, covering up your skin after dark is really essential to keeping that body clock in trained. And then once you've done that throughout the, the, obviously one day gone to bed and woken up the next day you have to repeat and do it again and again but you know it's not one of these things like people say it takes 12 weeks to make something a habit with I found with light it, it took two or three days and literally I could not could not live without you know getting up in the morning and doing this ritual and routine because I felt so amazing so uh, let's get a little bit more into the details here so on you're waking up you're going and you're staring at the sunlight right uh, or let me before I in, intrude on the staring are you going out and just watching the sunlight or are you practicing what I've guess come to be known as sun gazing so just looking directly into the sun and, you know, do you mind walking people through how that may not be such a bad thing for you? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, when the sun rises in the morning and that actually sets in the evening, um, the intensity of light changes. So during the, the first sort of sunrise period, you're going to have a very 
low lux um, light, probably about sort of 1800 Kelvin on the sunrise and the sunset. Um, so it's actually not really that difficult to look at. It also contains a lot yet less frequencies of invisible light like UV. Um, and it's very high in the sort of infrared spectrums as well. So, you know, with, with not having t your eyes sort of staring directly at the sun and being bombarded with UV light, which, you know, is a good and a bad thing. It's all a context. Um, you can actually look at the sun for um, long periods of time. And you want that um, because your central clock is in the center of your, um, you know, between your eyes. You really want that light going directly in. You know, a lot of the time it's about light angle when it comes to eyes as well gateway and we can come on to that when we talk about peripheral light in the evening as well um you know it's all about an angle so you know when i watch that sunrise in the morning it's a good point you make i actually look um for probably you know start off with a few seconds and then obviously build it up to sort of five ten minutes if, if you want um you really only need a few seconds of light to entrain your clock anyway to look directly at that sun and then as the intensity of the sun increases and it gets higher in the sky just look to the left or the right of it, um, and you'll still be getting those benefits. All right. So this is extremely helpful. Now, one more thing on the light. Well, we'll do a lot on light, actually. But when you're doing your research, what types of books were you coming across or researchers? Because you mentioned Jack Cruz, you mentioned Bill, and a few others. But what were sort of your go-to resources? Because if people want to geek out on this, I want to give them an avenue of just ways to pursue that. Yeah, absolutely. The, the first bit of advice I would give people that are listening to this show is forget books. As soon as a book's written, it's out of date. This is the, this is the problem. <laughs> you know, they, they write this book. It takes them you know, two years to write this thing. And then it takes them six months to sit with a publisher and an editor. And then it gets published. And then they're out of date. So I've not really found much sort of time to sit down and read these books. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I did years ago, but I didn't really find much help from it because by the time I finished reading it and went and delved into the literature, they really, you know, it was out of date. So I take a lot of my, there's a lot of free resources out there. So I do a lot of delving into the literature on PubMed, which is a, a free site. And I actually go on there and set up alerts that specific terms now that come up like melanopsin, melatonin, circadian rhythms, anything that's published with those buzzwords in comes into my inbox. And then I can look at the titles and see if there's something there that's relevant. But, you know, for, the, for someone that doesn't have the time to do that, you need to be seeking out individuals that are sort of become experts in their field. So, you know, you mentioned, um, obviously, Bill Lagercost, great to follow him, you know, for the price of four or five dollars a month, you can follow him on um, Patreon. And, and actually, he put some really, really um, good content out there. It's really easy to understand. Jack's good to follow if you if you want to level up maybe a bit more and you've got the time to actually try and interpret what he's saying. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's, it can be very complex, but a lot of people actually, and this is not to sort of um, sort of promote myself too much here, but a lot of people have uh, come to me because I, I take a lot of Jack's work and I, I, I interpret it and I put it into a very easy, understandable format in our light and health group. So, you know, a lot of people seek out sort of easy to understand um, people and rhetoric. So, you know, you're probably best off looking for those types of, of people. And another podcast that's well worth listening to on top of yours as well is Extreme Health Radio with, with Justin Stelman. He gets some really good guests on and he really delves into the detail without getting too complex. So you really got to sort of look at those, um, those types of people that are out to, you know, learn from some of the masters and then, you know, repeat it in a I guess a, a more understandable way um, would be my advice. Mm -hmm. So with with uh, circadian rhythm entrainment, so you're getting up in the morning and you're spending five to 10 minutes staring at the sun, even just a few seconds, right? At night, you're blocking the light. Is there anything else that you were doing when you were sort of going from that transition of keto to beyond, um, et cetera, that you found to be particularly useful? Yeah, ab absolutely. I think um, one thing that I was doing quite a lot when I was um, when I was doing keto was actually um, actually just sort of thinking food was the main sort of driver to health and just just eating macro and micronutrients whenever I fancied. And actually, when you start doing a little bit more research, you find that, that you know, circadianly speaking, you know, food and exercise actually have a time of when they should be eaten as well. So I actually, um, you know, started to actually before I got into the light side and, and looked at the circadian rhythms, it was actually. The first time I, I heard about the word circadian or phrase circadian rhythm um, was through Menno Henselman's, um, you know, he's a very um, sort of strong advocate of, I guess, 
ketogenic diets, but also sort of evidence-based training as well. So, you know, I started to train in, in um, sort of sync with my circadian rhythms as well and actually found that you know, training in the morning was much more beneficial to, to myself, given the hormone balance of a, a properly succinct circadian clock. And then I started to, um, you know, read a bit more from Bill about, um, you know, meal timing as well and, you know, how we should be really primed to eat the largest meal in, in the morning and, and actually not eat after dark. It was really interesting. There's, there's quite a few studies out there now um, that show without a doubt that if you eat food under, under blue light in the evenings, you're actually going to have, if it's higher in, in carbohydrate, you're going to have a harder time actually processing the glucose from that carbohydrate than you would if you ate them earlier in the day because of the hormone balance and the neuropeptides in, in the stomach and, and gastrointestinal um, tract at that time. So it really became clear to me that, you know, food wasn't everything and, you know, just the timing of things made a big difference. And, you know, ultimately that led me to the light side of things as well. And after I got into the light side, it just, you know, go down that rabbit hole. And, and I started to um, read that, you know, um, this, this thing called mitochondria that everyone's, everyone seems to know about, but, but doesn't know about um, how it works properly. And, you know, food food gurus were, were talking about you know oh you need these macronutrients to charge your you know your atp and produce your energy and this is how it works and um when you actually look at this i guess the structure and, and how mitochondria work it's more sort of electron train transport and it's actually you know taking the hydrogen and, and taking the protons and electrons from food and, and using them in specific ways rather than actually the food itself and then you look a little bit more into the literature and you see that actually sunlight can drive this production of energy as well. And you want to make the cell more efficient and making it more efficient, you need to expose yourself to cold and things like drinking the correct water and, and switching off your Wi-Fi not to damage your cells, um, easy zones and, and obviously heteroplasmy as well. So, you know, there's just so many different things that, you know, led me down that garden path. And I really just sort of wanted to specialize in, in the light arena. Um, and I know little bits about the other side, but, you know, because the, you know, the, the biohacking space is so, so big these days that, you know, if you try and do it all and become an expert in it all, you're just going to be, you know, someone like a, a, a Joe McCola where you're just sort of spitting out sound bites here and there. Some of it's right, some of it's not. So I would rather just sort of come in to be an expert of one thing. And that was just light. I just had a passion for it. And, wanted to, to delve into that more and you made a very good point on mercola um on the um so i want to go into something that you said earlier because there there's a word there that i guess it was recently discovered well relatively recently discovered that uh has a lot to do with this concept of blue light and you mentioned melanopsin and how you've spent a bit of time studying that do you mind just talking a little bit for people Assume that we don't know what melanopsin is. Do you mind just walking us through a high level what it is and why light can affect it? Yeah, absolutely. So before um, before we knew about melanopsin, we just assumed that um, our eyes would, you know, take in this this light. It would go through to the pineal gland. Messages would be sent um, to the central clock, and everything would be entrained. And then, sort of about 10, 15 years ago, they discovered that melanopsin was actually present in the eye. And this is just like any other opsin that can be found in the eye. But it, um, it became very special because it is actually a photoreceptor. So it's extremely um, sensitive to blue light, typically in that sort of 485 nanometer sort of wavelength. And what it does is it... Um, it's, it's a receptor that picks up the blue frequencies. So like we were saying earlier, when you go and watch that sunrise in the morning, it takes the blue frequency from all the spectrums that are coming down and it translates that into, right, now it's time to release the cortisol. Now it's time to um, suppress melatonin and feel alert and awake. And it does the same thing after dark, obviously, if it's going in your eyes, that's why we block it, because we don't want to excite that photoreceptor melanopsin and, and tell our brain and pass on the um, information that it's daytime. And, you know, what, um, what really sort of got me looking into melanopsin about um, 18 months ago um, was that blind people actually still had circadian rhythms. And that really interests me because I was just like, well, you know, they, they've got a obviously a dysfunctional eye, um, you know, a lot of the time they found that, you know, melanopsin even was destroyed or degraded within their eyes, which was, and I was just like, well, 
how are they getting a circadian rhythm? And, and I was just thinking sort of along the lines of initially, maybe it's the meal timing, maybe it's cold and temperature cues and things like that, which probably is a bit, little bit. Um, and then I started to think, well, maybe the skin's got some sort of something to do with this. And, and didn't really take it much further than that. There wasn't any evidence to back it up. And then a study came out at the end of 2017 which showed that melanopsin was actually present in the fat cells and that um, when you were sort of under full spectrum sunlight, it would take the blue and it would actually reduce, melanopsin actually reduce, reduce lipid particle size and it would actually um, increase leptin as well. So it sort of gave us more evidence that you should be eating at that time of the day from a circadian standpoint. So melanopsin gave us that insight and proved that, you know, you should be eating, you know, breakfast like a king and uh, lunch like a prince and dinner like a pauper that that is totally true and, and that was that evidence really sort of showed us that that was the case and then a few weeks after that another study came out which was an absolute game changer in the light industry and that was that they found melanopsin in the um in the skin um and they actually found it in the in the brain as well so when we're talking about melanopsin you know this is hot off the press this is like 12 months ago that they actually found this in the skin in the brain and it actually acts in the exact same way as as it does in the eye um, so, um, what happens is if you're actually exposing yourself after dark, you know, and, and you're sit, sitting maybe in a singlet in a vest, um, or you're sat with shorts on and you've got the lights on, you're actually still, still going to mess up your circadian rhythms. It doesn't matter if you're wearing blue box glasses, um, it's still going to damage, um, and, and desynchronize your, your master clock. So you actually now, because melanopsin is in your skin, you need to be covering up. And when this, you can see behind me now, the sun going down, when that sun sets at 7.30, I'll be getting my hoodie on, probably getting the air con on because it's about 40 degrees today. But <laughs> centigrade, um, so probably over, well over 100 Fahrenheit for, for, for your American listeners. Um, and and putting, putting trousers on, like get my linen trousers on and, and cover up because you know, you've really got to protect those, um, those areas of the skin from the blue light as well, otherwise you can mess your clock up. So, you know, melanopsin is, um, is, is, is majorly important when it comes to managing blue light. And one disease that um, has really, really skyrocketed recently, which um, is, is again a disease of melanopsin dysfunction from what I've been reading, is Hashimoto, so um, hypothyroidism. And as you can see, we're talking to each other now, both of our necks are exposed to, you know, the blue light coming from our screens. And, you know, we're probably both fortunate enough that we have, you know, flux or iris on our computers anyway, and we manage our light environment. But, you know, imagine, the, and it's more common in females, and I'll, I'll explain why I think that as well. Imagine sitting at your desk all day, typing away on your computer with that light shining on that area of your, yeah, of your thyroid. It's really not good. It's going to mess your testosterone up. It's going to mess all sorts of things up. And then, you know, it has led to Hashimoto's. And it's not so bad for men in the corporate environment because what do they wear? They wear a shirt and typically they wear a tie. And that will, you know, that will probably protect that area. And it's actually a lot higher, this, this, this disease, in women because they probably wear more sort of V-neck type, um, type tops, which is really exposing that region. And what we've got to remember is that the thyroid is, you know, a matter of millimeters under the skin. So, um, you know, over penetrating um, blue light into that area, destroying melanopsin and actually causing a, a dysfunctional clock within your, um, with, within your thyroid. And, you know, it's, it's, that sort of leads on quite nicely to... to tell people that we don't just have one clock, we have a master clock, but we have peripheral clocks. Clocks are in our skin, they're in our, they're in our ears, they're in every cell, they're in our organs. In our liver, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. our liver. That's why it's so important that you know, we get everything right, not just about light, but about the food time and the meal time and the temperatures of, um, of the day as well, because we're you know, these living beings that respond to external stimuli um from the environment and you know those things we just mentioned being just a few of them yeah i think one of the things that i like to tell all of our clients is like getting into routines for a lot of people that may seem boring but if you want to really reach top performance that routine is absolutely necessary because your body like this meat suit that we're in didn't just develop you know 32 years ago it developed over hundreds of thousands of generations and it became very smart right 
And so on the let's let's go into I love the point you made about thyroid and Hashimoto's and et cetera. Practical takeaways for people that may have that office job. Are we talking wearing a scarf? What would be sort of the ways that we can we can hedge our risk, so to speak? Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, you, you've hit the nail on the head. The first obvious protocol is, is to get that thyroid covered up. And, you know, it's probably easier for for women to do that as well, because, you know, they can wear like a shawl or some sort of scarf or a, a turtleneck um, sweater or something like that that will get it covered up. So no, that's always got to be your first port of call. But, you know, you want to be putting blue light filters on your computer if you can as well. You know, even if it's just a screen protector in the, in the, in, in the start um, or a software like a Flux or, a, um, or an Iris that's going to going to reduce that blue down and, and really, you know, not bombard the thyroid or the, or the other areas of your skin as well. Another thing that's really important to do as well is, you know, it's not just about managing the immediate environment that you're sat at. You actually need to be outside um, a fair bit as well. And, you know, one of the things that um, that I do when, when I'm sat sort of working is um, I like to just get out maybe once an hour um, because, that you know, during different parts of the day, the, the, the solar spectrum is always changing. So your eyes and skin need to be, um, you know, witnessing you know, the sun really every hour because it's changing and it's sending different hormonal um, uh, signals to, to the to the body and to the brain. So you need to be out there a fair bit as well. And, you know, I know people can't really get out every hour. So my advice to them is, you know, we've always got that one or two or three people in the office that like to go out and have a cigarette break. Um, so, you know, you need to be telling your boss that, you know, well, my break is a sun break. I only need, I only need seconds of it. I'm going to get downstairs 60 seconds and just, you know, be out in that sun and you'll find that you know you know just just the dopamine and serotonin effect of actually being out in the sun is going to make you feel great as well but you know it's also going to mitigate the effects of the blue light you're having from your um, office environment because you've got you know some very beneficial restorative frequencies in there that are sort of in the lower sort of energy sort of rating light that you know your reds and your orange lights and and also your invisible um, infrared and uv that's really going to sort of charge that mitochondria but also you know look to reduce inflammation as well specifically uh, specifically that on the um sort of infrared side of things as well this is super helpful andy now on the uh, the earlier point you made around when the sun goes down changing into clothes how does that look in practice like should we even if it's 40 degrees out be putting ourselves into the hoodie and sweatpants or is there other ways to do this like can i get away with just incandescent light at night are there other practical hedges other than just dressing up in sort of the the suit, if you will? Yeah, fantastic question. It really is. Um, and you know, one of the the, the first point would be, um, you know, doesn't have to be sweatpants and hoodies. Linen's great. Um, so look at that as well. But you know, one of the big things, big teachings that I like to say, and I say it all the time, and you know, it's probably not uh, it's probably not good uh, good business when I'm trying to sell blue blockers. But I always say to people you need to fix your environment first. You, you have to, you have to look at addressing what the normal things that we have in our house that are actually causing you, causing you damage. Um, and the first thing that, that I did was replace the majority of my lamps um, around to, to red. Um, so I've got incandescent and halogen bulbs in there. The LED if you if you want, but the issue with LED is you still got flicker. Do you mind just touching on the, the, differences between the two because i think a lot of people are saying okay led is what's in my tv they have light you know you have an led light but like why why incandescent why halogen yeah so so incandescent and halogen are, are better incandescent is the best typically I, I don't use incandescent number one they're very difficult to get hold of and two i'm sick of replacing them every week <laughs> that that is true <laughs> it's a nightmare so like literally put them in pop and they're gone so i um i use halogen which is a good sort of alternative and the reason um those two incandescent and halogen are good is, is is because they don't flicker the way light sort of affects the body is it actually affects it a whole hell of a lot more when it's not steady state it's more pulsed um, so sort of like a, pul uh, a pulsed electromagnetic um, frequency in, in any sort of situation is always going to be bad and light isn't any exception to that. So, you know, I, 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 there's a really good test that people can do and it's not too bad on monitors these days, but if you've got an old monitor, do the test and if you want to test the fluorescent lights at, at work, do it. Get your iPhone and film in slow-mo and you will see, oh, 
it would blow your mind how much flicker, like literally just pulsing across the screen and it's just bombarding your eyes constantly. So, you know, LEDs um, typically do that. There are actually a couple of brands out there that, um, that don't flicker, that are in um, sort of the red spectrum. They're actually in the States, which is really good. I, I believe Brian Hoyer actually tested them with, with some expensive kit from what I heard, and they came back flicker-free. Um, I think they were called Sunlight, um, but light spelt as in L-I-T-E. Um, so I haven't tried them, but I've heard they're very good. So that's why you want to be going for incandescent. Um, but also, you've got to bear in mind as well, of, of we spoke about it a bit, a bit earlier as well, was, was light intensity, so lux. Um, an incandescent and halogen bulb is not going to be as bright as um, LED. And you don't want to have very high intensity light after dark. Um, you want that sort of lower intensity that's going to soothe and relax you. So anything that's got you know, really high intensity light is, is really meant for the day. Um, and after dark, you want that sort of more soothing, you know, less intense light. So, you know, if another good thing to have is if you don't want to turn your house into a, looking like a brothel and having all the red lights in there, you can actually dim your lights as well. If you want to keep your LEDs and don't want to join the biohacking crazies like myself, there's actually studies out there that show that dim light actually does have a, an effect on, um, on melatonin, um, less so than actually higher lux light. So get some dimmers on there if, if you know, it's, it's, it's probably worth doing as well. Cause you know, a lot of us don't want to, you know, go into the middle of the woods and, and just live in a log cabin with, you know, a paraffin lamp. It's, it's just not practical. And, you know, a lot of my mantra as well is, is teaching people that you don't have to do that. There are, there are hacks you can do to really correct that, um, that environment. The, the only one that's difficult to correct is the television, because obviously a lot of people want to watch their shows in, in, you know, normal colors. I mean, you can watch them with blue blockers on, that's fine. But maybe it's a case of, you know, watching your TV for a couple of hours after dark and then maybe switching it off, getting the red lights on and having a read or something like that or, or talking. And then you'll be able to, like you were sort of alluding to earlier, change into a habit that's a little bit more sort of healthier and, and a little bit more empowering as well to yourself because, you know, you can sit and watch your soaps all night, but, you know, treat yourself to a couple of hours of that and then sit down with a book or a study and um, start to sort of give yourself the tools you need to, to really change and, and make yourself optimal. Or talk to your spouse, right? It's a great way to kind of re-engage in your relationship and, uh, and have an even more fulfilling relationship in a way. But you re you, um, Mentioned a few good points on the Flickr side. I know you're friends with him, but uh, Daniel Georgiev has come on the show and talk about that pretty extensively and how Iris helps that. So I encourage people to check out that episode, but also uh, the red light thing is brilliant. By the way, uh, I did that in Amsterdam, which is a place that is known for a red light district. So I'm sure I have a few neighbors that are kind of wondering what the hell I'm doing, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> It, it yeah, works so true um but yeah no da daniel's great and you know the difference um we we've spoken at length and we we, we endorse each other's products because we only want to partner with the best and you know da daniel's great because iris actually um actually reduces flicker it almost eliminates it um completely and the other sort of competing um platform is, is flux and, and it doesn't it just sort of dims the, the blue light down so um, you know, what Daniel is doing is, is actually revolutionizing the, um, you know, blue light blocking to actually taking into effect flicker. Um, you don't want those PEMFs um, pulsing into your skin and your eyes. And, and also, I used to suffer from migraines um, many years ago as well. And I swear it was, you know, pulse light and flicker because since you and I, I, I literally don't get them anymore. Um, and, you know, if it's, it's probably a, it's probably a blue light issue as well, to be fair. You know, I, I think Flick is a major player. It really is. And I'm so glad that he's doing some work on, uh, on that and, and is constantly sort of upgrading and um, making his, uh, making his software better. So yeah, I would say, you know, if you're using Flux, try Iris, it, it's going to cost you a, five, 10 bucks, but it's going to be well worth it. Absolutely. I a hundred percent agree with you. I use it every day. It's brilliant. So let's talk a blue light blocker. So we're going back to our, our, um, our room at night, we've changed our light bulbs, we put on our linen clothes, etc. Blue light blockers protecting our eyes. Now, one of the things that I've found with different pairs, etc., unless you get the wraps, there is light sneaking in. Do you mind talking, uh, you hinted at earlier about peripheral light. Do you mind talking about how that either affects us or doesn't? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's a question I get every day. And to be fair, I, I, 
our customer service team at Blue Box have um, have a generic email set up to, to answer it because it's 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 a, like an hourly question. It's unbelievable. But you know, it's it's a, it's it's a it's a logical question, and I encourage people to ask these questions because you know until sort of recently um, after speaking to several sort of specialists in the field about peripheral light, it all comes down to angle. And, you know, number one, before we even get into talking about peripheral light, if you're concerned about it, hack your light environment first, get the red lights in, then you don't have to, don't have to stress about it, whether you believe what I'm about to say or not, but you've got to look at the anatomy of the eye. Okay. So you've got to look at where the, I guess the photosensitive receptors are located within the retina um, and these are called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells so you don't need to your listeners don't need to learn that we call it IPRGC cells and the, what they do is um, that they're, they're actually located deep within the inner retina a lot of people just think that you know it's just a matter of the eye but it's actually these IPRGC cells that are located in the retina um, and any minor light, um, light that basically leaks around the side is, is not enough for the pupillary light reflex to actually phototransduct at any great degree, which will actually cause um, the iris to widen any further and let in peripheral light. So it really is all about light angle. If you know, you're, you're, like we were talking about the sun gazing earlier, you've got to be looking directly at it to get the full benefits. It's very much the same after dark, but you know, any minor light that leaks around the side is really not going to impact you hugely the first port of call that i would be looking at um before, even before peripheral light is protecting your skin and you know if, if 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 you still feel like the peripheral light is an issue there's always wraparound glasses to to wear as well but then you know you're, you're gonna suffer things like i mean there's there's studies out there that show that actually excluding oxygen from actually getting into your eye can actually damage it in the long in the long run as well so if you're actually wearing wraparound glasses you know three four hours before you go to bed every single night for 20 years you could actually be damaging your eyes as well so the fact that multiple people have now said to me within this profession that you know it's the IPRGC cells and, and the light angle and where they're actually located within the eye it doesn't actually become such a big deal than that people actually think. This is interesting. Now, I want to go back because there's one question that I forgot to ask you before we go into the, the night side of the blue light blockers. Sunglasses. Everybody has them. It's a huge ass business, right? What's the value there in terms of should people have them? Should people be wearing them? Is it going to throw off our circadian rhythms? Uh, for somebody like me who has blue eyes and has particularly sensitive uh almost no melanin. Um, I'm particularly sensitive to light. What, what do, what should people be doing? Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good question again. Um, so general rule of thumb is you don't want to be, you don't want to be wearing sunglasses, but I'm going to put some context to this because I do sometimes and I'll tell you why. It's really, you've really got to understand your environment and where you're from. And you've also got to understand your ancestry as well. Um, Ultimately, nature and, and the way that we're put together biologically, we're always going to have um, mechanisms in place that protect us somewhat. And I say somewhat because some of the environments we live in today are actually been tainted or changed by human activity. So if I talk about Australia, we live in a, um, an environment where we have a lot more ultraviolet light coming through from space because of the, um, the de degradation of the um, ozone layer from CFCs many years ago. It's getting a lot better now, but we have extremely high UV. And you can tell that because, you know, I, I build up my solar callus myself from um, making sure I'm in the sun early in the mornings um, and late at night. And, you know, I have a constant all year round tan. But I find that when I go to climates on sort of higher latitudes, like the Mediterranean, um, for instance, that it's a lot easier for me to do. Um, whereas in Australia, if I'm out for long periods of time, solar callus or no solar callus, I will burn. And that's because of the amount of um, UV, which really isn't natural coming through Australia. So I am also a firm believer that sunglasses should be worn if, if, if you're exposed to, to something called glare. Um, so if you're skiing, sometimes when you're at the beach and the, if the sand's very white and that's glaring into your eyes you, you want to be protecting your eyes there because you're getting a lot of um you know high intensity uv being put into the eye so you, you've got to kind of look at it from a contextual point of view but you know i'm not i'm not advocating sunglasses use constantly i think that when you're up in the morning and training your body clock you don't want to be wearing them when you're watching the sunset you don't want to be wearing them and if you're out for short periods at a time you don't want to be wearing them but you know you don't also if you're at the beach and there's a lot of glare 
you don't want to be wearing them from 10 o'clock till six o'clock at night. You know, you want to be just, just looking at your environment and thinking of when you want to be wearing them and when you don't want to be wearing them, because ultimately it's, it's your environment and what you're, what you're going to be subjected to so here i'm not actually advocating wearing sunglasses i think that there's certain areas like in australia if you're out for at specific times of the day i think if you're skiing you need to be protecting your eyes and if you're at the beach to a certain extent you may need them but you don't want to be wearing them as a rule of thumb i mean i don't i don't wear mine pretty much 99 percent of the time i'm wearing my sunglasses let's say and it's very very rare that you'll see me wearing them but you know I don't think it's as simple as a lot of people say. I know Jack says don't wear them at all. I, I don't think it's that simple. I really don't. Um, I think you have to look at it very, very contextually. And, you know, I have blue eyes as well. And I think it's very a very good point that you made. You know, like we, we have blue eyes because we have a lot less melanin in our eyes. And, you know, we, we make melanin in our skin very easily from exposing ourselves to ultraviolet light. And it's not, not so much as easy in... In, in the eyes I mean it can be done but not to the same extent so you know blue eyes all came from you know sort of higher latitude sort of Scandinavian maybe sort of northern European Danish um, German sort of um, ancestry and you know so it's a mutation that happened many years ago and, and I'd imagine from an evolutionary point of view it was to allow obviously more UV light into the eyes to actually do what it's supposed to do and turn DHA into a DC electric current and help charge the mitochondria. But what we've got to think of with blue eyes is we, the blue eyes are probably optimal in that area that we've just described. And, you know, if, um, you know, a hominin from millions and millions of years ago would have wanted to migrate, it would have taken them, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years to a get a whole to lifetime, something. right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Which would have allowed for adaptations to happen. So, you know, we've got to be a little bit more careful, but there are a couple of couple of interesting studies that have actually shown sort of two mechanisms that could actually lead to people with blue eyes actually having some protection. And, and the first one is, is ciliary muscles. So they're within the iris and what they do, is they actually, they're responsible for either narrowing or widening the eye. And you find that when you're actually in the, um, in the sun and there's more UV light, we will actually, with blue eyes, and you're, you're a test to this, we actually squint a lot more um, and we can't fully open our eyes. And, you know, that's not a bad thing. That's just an evolutionary mechanism that is actually making our eyes a lot smaller. So the surface area is less and yet less UV light is actually going to pass through when we've had enough, which is normally not long at all. Um, and there's also another thing called the aqueous humor, which is an interocular fluid. And when we're in the sun for long periods of time, our eyes will actually brighten. And that sort of very subtle change um, in color actually helps drive more production of this fluid. And you'll probably find that maybe your eyes water a little bit more when you're in the sun with your eyes. Um, and what that does is that actually scatters and absorbs some of the UV light, which actually protects it from getting in the inner retina as well. So there are mechanisms, mechanisms in place. But again, somewhere like Australia with blue eyes and exposing them all day, you know, you might, it, it depends how long you're outside for, it really does. And, you know, contrary to what people say, you can increase melanin in the eye, but it's very temporary and you're not just suddenly going to go from blue to brown eyes. And I, I posted um, about this um, quite recently, actually, it was quite good timing that you, you mentioned it. I, I did a post in the Light and Health Group a little bit about it, which, which gained quite a lot of um, attention because I wanted to see in there if, if people actually experienced I, I changed color and a lot of people actually did but funnily enough it was um you know people going from sort of blue to greens um and sort of having seasonal changes in in their eye colors um you know not, not going from like blue to sort of brown or anything like that but what one guy said that he went from brown to blue which was really interesting and asked me what I thought about that and I was like I have no idea what that's about so maybe <laughs> a doctor, but um yeah so it's, it's a really interesting one and, and one that needs a lot more sort of attention and but you know there, there are mechanisms in places I've just described that really sort of help do that and a lot of people will see those as like squinting and eye watering is like oh i've had too much uv and yes to a certain extent but you know no to the other extent that yeah these are mechanisms that are actually helping your helping you stay out in the um in the sun and, um, and actually protect you from you know cataracts um from the uv light yeah i think the thank you for elucidating that because I was just in Africa, right? And I was in a desert, the Namib Desert, which is the old, oldest desert in the world. And there was points where, and I like you, I try not to wear sunglasses, but there's, 
there's points where you're like driving and oh my god you're just looking at sand and i would be blind if i went 100 percent without sunglasses so that 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 explanation was very helpful now i want to go back to the blue light blockers because this is a field that is is interesting and i think among clients i get numerous questions every day as to like how do i identify a good pair because as with anything in the world when people seem to find a trend or products start to come out there's both good and bad how do you if you're a, just the average run of the mill person how do you tell which ones to buy because there's there are a number of ones out there and not all of us are as plugged into the health world as we probably should be. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. And there's literally no information out there for, for people. And um, before I go on to some hacks of how to actually identify them now, I'm going to be releasing very soon. I haven't mentioned this to anyone yet. So your listeners going to be the first to hear it is um, I actually have a spectrograph um, spectrometer cost me a lot of money. But, um, you know, I, I, I felt as a business, I needed it um, because I want it. I actually want to write a blog and I'll be writing it this weekend um, and hopefully publishing it this weekend as well. It might, might take me a little bit more time, but I've actually tested 10 pairs of the top selling blue blockers out there um, against what they're claiming um, and against what they're actually blocking. And there's probably going to get me in a little bit of trouble from these people but I'm <laughs> anyway because um, I tell you what, it's going to shock, shock everyone when they see it. It's awful honestly yes uh, you're going you're going after swannies i'm imagining or something like that <laughs> yeah look Sw swannies are in there there's a few others in there as well we've um we we've tested uvex um which you know a lot of people um use because they're cheap yeah seven bucks but yeah swannies have been tested in there as well they they had a um an old pair of glasses that they they replaced recently with a new sort of set of, of lenses and they're not as not as bad as they were but they're still letting in there's, there's blue light still coming in, let's put it that way. Uh, there, there was one sort of um, up and coming brand that's come out that's been very, I won't mention them yet, but they've been very honest about what they block and what they don't block. And their test result actually came back exactly as they said. So they're being very honest, but they're, again, they're being very honest, but their glasses aren't right because they're not blocking in the wavelengths that they need to. So I wrote a blog a, a while ago and um, it's quite high up in, in the Google rankings now. I think it gets on page one, which is really good. And I'm hoping this one will as well, because it's got going to have so much information in, you know, it's going to be very unbiased. It's going to be very much like, here are the results. Here is all the data, everything put in. I'll probably do some videos on it as well down the line. Um, but one that actually took all the literature on blue light, we documented it in a blog where we said, right, looking at, you know, these top 20 studies on the, on the field of what a blue what what's frequencies of blue light and actually green light um, suppress melatonin. And it's very, very clear without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and, you know, people like um, Dave Asprey, um, Matt Maruka, they will all agree with me on this. And, and we've spoken, we've all spoken about it at length anyway, that the biggest mel melatonin disruption zone um, is from that sort of 400 all the way through to 550. Frequencies from in the green range up to 550 having similar effects to, to what blue light is doing uh, in, in disrupting our circadian rhythm. So if your blue blocker glasses do not block 100%, well, let's just say, let's just say 99.9% because there's always margin for error, blue and green light from 550 down to 400, you're completely wasting your time. And it's, it doesn't matter if it's 20% or 40% or, or 5%. If, if there's any amount of that getting through that, sort of direct access into your eye you might as well not be wearing them honestly like all it takes is a few seconds and and you're done so you really got to make sure that when you're going out and buying a pair of glasses um whether it be blue blocks whether it be swannies or uvex or whatever just ask them for the lens report say can i see a lens report ultimately you won't have to do that soon so you just go to blue blocks and there'll be a whole list of all the different um glasses and we'll hope to add to that blog as we go um and get you know 30 40 different brands on there but um you know, you, you can also, when you get your pair of glasses as well, test them, um, you know, make sure that you, you know, maybe go up to some of your appliances or put something blue on the TV and put your glasses on. If you're seeing any blue, then send them back. It's, it's, it's no good. So that, that's probably the best test to do. But, you know, there's so much misleading information out there and people saying, like, yeah, these, these 
you know, block this or block that, and they actually don't, which is, is really bad because people go and spend, you know, seventy, eighty dollars on a on a pair of of blue blockers and and then be useless. And you know, when you actually start looking at how to act where these i mean when i first went sam went after this this market and identified that there was a lot of pretty much every blue light glasses out there are useless i found out where they're all making them because i contacted initially all the manufacturers that actually make these glasses and i didn't realize it at the time but i stumbled across it and it's very obvious who they use and they use chinese markets um it quickly became apparent to me that China wasn't producing the quality that we needed. So, you know, I, I, I went out and I partnered with, we, we work with an optics lab. We don't work with, you know, a, just a random sort of company in China. Everything is done in Australia. Frames um, and, and the lens tinting, everything is done here. And, you know, I live 20K away from it. So I can just drive down there, pop in and be like, right, what are you doing? I want to see the test. I'm, I'm, I use my spectrometer to test the lenses. I've, I've even sent, um, you know, 10, 20 pairs back once because, you know, there was about 5% coming through at 550. And I was like, well, nope, take them back, get rid of them, do them again. We, we, we've got to make sure that they are optimal. And I don't want to be selling a, a lie to someone, you know, it's, you know, we've got to make sure that 100% is blocked. And that's the only way to do it. Thank you for walking through that because... It, it's literally a question I get from every client because I am, I'm a big endorser of them uh, as a technology just because we all live in this world where we're inundated with a computer screen, Netflix, et cetera. I almost feel like they're a necessity. So uh, it's, really, it's really good to see that. And of course, we'll link to that blog in the show notes. Uh, I imagine I'll almost get kind of the reaction that when Sauna Space went and kind of investigated a little bit more on the red light side of, of things, hopefully we get that much traction with this article too. But um, Andy, this has been super helpful. I want to go into a few kind of final questions, if you will, because I think uh, all of this has been really informative. But for you, what do you feel like the world is overlooking when it comes to health? Because right now we are arguably in a public health crisis in multiple countries. Uh, the world is probably heavier than it's been. Longevity is a little bit debatable. What do you think the world is overlooking? I think the, uh, there's a lot of things they're overlooking. I think um, it's, it's hard to pinpoint sort of one thing. Um, I think what they're, they're, they're missing the most um, is a concept rather than sort of one particular thing. And that's a concept of we have basically not evolved much in the last sort of few hundred thousand years. But culturally speaking, we've evolved and technologically speaking, we've evolved at a far far faster pace than, than our culture and we're living in an environment now that we cannot thrive in and we do not our, our authorities that govern us and dictate policy do not understand that and they need to understand that they need to understand that it's not just about putting people on weight watchers or keto whatever diet you want to do it's about addressing that environment and until we we, we actually realize that we won't be able to actually move forward with, you know, creating an optimal human, human race. And it's, um, you know, I'm not saying like, you know, we need to throw out the Wi-Fi. We need to, we need to halt cultural um, evolution. Not at all. I think that once we understand and actually take note of the outliers like myself, Jack Cruz, yourself, Bill Lagacos, that are actually speaking a lot of sense and truth, um, they'll realize that, okay, well, we don't need you know, LED lights, we need red lights, we, we need to make our computer screens um, less sort of um, in blue light, le less frequencies in blue light. We need to tell people that, you know, it's not about just doing exercise, it's about watching the sunrise, it's about turning your Wi-Fi off at night, about plugging the ethernet in rather than using Wi-Fi and drinking good quality water. But unfortunately, as, as a, a capitalist um, driven world, I guess, um, in 90% in of the case, that won't happen because you know, money will always rule, policy will uh, take years and years to, to even come through. And um, it just wouldn't make any sort of capitalist sense to do. So, you know, we've really got to empower ourselves and, and make the changes ourselves. And, and when you actually delve into the rabbit hole and, and start sort of learning about these things, um, they actually don't cost you a lot of money. I mean, you know, a pair of, of blue block of glasses that I'm wearing now for, from my company is like 150 Aussie, so like 100 US. But they're going to last you a lifetime unless you break them, um, but sitting or something like that. But you know, they're good quality. They're going to last a long time. Like buying good quality, um, low deuterium content water um, isn't expensive. By San Pellegrino, by Icelandic Glacial, and um, it's not that much more expensive. Wi-Fi turning that off off at night 
it's a free thing, flick the switch. But looking at the sun, it's free. Going, having a cold shower, it's free. You know, there's so many free things you can actually do that keep you in the environment you're still in, but make enough change that actually mitigates a lot of the damage that it's causing on you biologically speaking. Yeah, just going out and putting your bare feet on the ground. Like You can do it. I live in Amsterdam and it's roughly freezing today going out and you're not going to die for if you go out there for 10 minutes and just put your bare feet on the ground. It's extremely well said, Andy. That's great. Favorite book on high performance? Yeah, it's a hard one for me to answer because I don't really read books uh, per se. Um, or if you have a, if you have a favorite, I, I've never taken the question this way, but if you have a favorite research paper, we can do that too. Yeah, I, I think the, the, okay, the, the best paper for anyone to read as an entry into light is one in 2001 by a guy called Phelps. I'll link it to you after this. Um, and it talks about, it was one of the sort of, first major studies they did on um, looking at how blue light affected people's sleep after dark. And yeah, they found that, you know, blue light uh, in, in the specific blue light spectrum was really detrimental. And they coined a lot of good phrases in that study as well. One that, you know, our bodies don't need total darkness. They need physiological darkness, which means blocking blue light. And they actually use blue blockers um, in the study as well, which really sort of excited me um, to, to read as well. And, you know, I guess it, it's not a book, but Bill's blog, great. You know, Jack's, Jack's work, great. But yeah, I mean, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the books I read many years ago, which actually sort of still resonates with me, um, is the um, story of, of mankind. And I, I can't for the life of me remember who wrote it. Um, I want to say like Leibovitz or someone like that, Daniel Leibovitz or someone like that. But And is it called the, is it called the story of mankind or is it, uh, is it like sapiens or something? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll dig it out and I'll, I'll link it or the evolution of mankind, something like that. And it was really good because, you know, it really talked about how, not just how we evolved, um, but also it gave a lot of insight into um, the cultural sort of evolution outstripping our biology and it talked about diseases being a mismatch of our environment and that really resonated to me and really did help me sort of get down the path of researching but the only issue with that book was when I started researching a lot of it was out of date you know they started to find that we didn't come out of Africa we were in Asia first and things like that so you know that's sort of my yeah that would probably be my recommendation um, and just apologies I can't get you the exact title of it it's been so long but yeah, it got me into the, the environmental side of things and looking at disease as a mismatch of our environment rather than food. So all the show notes, by the way, we'll link to this is at decodingsuperhuman.com slash blue blocks. Next question for you. Uh, favorite trick for enhancing focus? Let's say you have something to do and you have a very, maybe not even a strict deadline, but look, you're blogging, you're running a company, etc. How do you enhance your focus? Yeah, just Number one, being outside, if you can do it, just get outside. It's amazing. You're going to get so many feel-good hormones going. But, you know, a lot of um, a lot of the time as well, get your shoes off, go and ground to be focused. Like, that really helps. But, you know, my mind is very active all the time, and, and I have to look at sort of mindfulness practices as well. So, you know, a lot of that is training the mind to be present and rather than sort of, you know, focusing on loads of different things, try and focus on that one task. So, you, you know, I don't think there's a magic sort of nootropic or, a you know, a mind-enhancing drug to take. I just think that practicing mindfulness is really good for me. It might be different for other people, but I also find that if I'm very stressed, um, I'll go for a walk and I'll find a nice patch of grass and I'll just feel the grass on my feet. And that is incredible. That is incredibly relaxing for me. Um, there's a lot of evidence that shows that obviously grounding does affect the brain in a very positive way. So, you know, again, a um, couple of things there that are free. You can get a free sort of mindfulness app and you can just get your shoes off and get outside and, you know, really sort of clear the mind that way, which um, works for me. Where can people learn more about you, Andy? Yeah, the best place to, to learn um, uh, and, and sort of follow what I'm talking about and, and join the discussion is the Light and Health Group. Um, we're about 6,000 of us in there now. It's probably the most active biohacking group because I'm a member of them all. So, um, you know, we're not just posting something and getting four or five likes and a couple of comments you know we're, we're easily getting sort of 20 30 comments per and discussions going per post and you know well over a couple of hundred sort of likes on those so we're saying sort of really up-to-date stuff so the way i run that group is i actually um take a lot of studies that have come out that week and then i post them straight away with my understanding of those studies so you're getting real-time access to, to current information 
but we also everyone else posts in the group as well so it is moderated so we don't get any crap in there whatsoever um, I have to reject a lot of posts, but people asking questions like, oh, what frequencies of red light do I need to, to expose myself to? Or, you know, I've got Hashimoto's, what hacks has everyone used? And we've got so many good minds in that group. It's, you know, it's not even funny how many good minds are in there. You know, we've got people, Nathan Walls in there. We've got people like um, uh, Matt Maruka in there as well. We've got, um, Jack, you know, even Jack Cruz is, I, I believe, a member in that group as well. Matt Blackburn, who's got very sort of, unique and disruptive ideas about certain things um justin stelman extreme health radio um luke story you know people like that that are that are weighing in doris Lowe as well another great person that really takes everything that i believe in um and tries to crush it but i like that and i like her posting in there because you know i'm not about teaching something that um isn't true and and you know if, if evidence comes to light down down the line that what i've been saying is wrong then i will always reserve my right to change that and what i want people to understand is that i like to teach based on the evidence that is available now and i think a lot of people have fed back that they like that about myself and my company blue blocks because everything is evidence-based it's not woo it's all evidence it's not in the literature we can talk about it, but we make sure it's, it's stated this isn't backed up by evidence, but anecdotally speaking, this is good. So, you know, we try and keep everything evidence-based and keep the discussion open and courteous, and there's never a stupid question um, to ask. And we encourage everyone to, to come there and just, you know, ask some questions and just, or even just ghost and, and read some of the discussions because there's some very, very clever minds in there, a lot a lot brighter than myself that, that weigh in on, on a lot of discussions. So it's good, to, it's good to see. Yeah, I would say I sit as the ghost part where it's just interesting to, again, see the stuff that you're posting, others are posting. I know Jack does post there quite a bit, but it, it is a wonderful resource. And you mentioned Doris and I really appreciate some of her work too. So uh, that's excellent. Now talk a little bit more about your company, how people can find you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we're on all social media. So blueblocks.com is a good place to start. Um, obviously, it's our website. So it has our products on there and it has a good explanation of all the different colored lenses you can buy and why you would need specific lenses. Um, so that's just blueblocks.com. So that's B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com. And they have obviously contact page on there as well so if there's anything you're unsure of just drop us a line and, and the team will get back to you and answer it or if i'm on there i'll get back and answer you as well we're on very active on on instagram um and also on uh, facebook and, and, and twitter and linkedin as well so just do a search for us there's not many other blue blockers out there so <laughs> quite easy to find um twitter um we're on as well um you're probably better off following me personally so like andyman 80 or just type that in it's a few thousand people that sort of weigh in on, on some discussions there but it's very evidence-based on there and it's very nutrition focused um, because that was where I started but I'm trying to convince them all that it's light as well and slowly getting there and they're, they're probably the probably the main the main places to find us light and health um, is great but yeah blue, jump on the website and take a look as well and you know, happy to help with any any queries anyone has or any questions. And, you know, if we need to provide charts or evidence to you guys, then just let us know and we'll happily um, happily share it. Perfect. And you guys deliver all over the world. Is that right? All over the world. Free shipping as well option for all over the world. So there's free shipping and there's also express options as well. It just depends how quickly you want them. To be fair, it's actually funny, even though we're an Australian based company, um, 60% of our um, business is actually done in America. So you guys are way ahead of everyone else, like probably only 20% in Australia, which is bizarre. But we just don't have the infrastructure in place of people like yourself, you know, actually wanting to speak about it. You know, all the shows I've done have been Europe or, um, or, or the US, apart from one in Australia. So yeah, US is our biggest um, our biggest clientele. We've got, um, obviously our prices on our website are in Australian dollars. Um, so don't go on there and think that's the US price. It says AU and then the dollars but there's, um, it will automatically change to US dollars as well. And there's, if it doesn't, you just click on it and it will bring them up in US. And then at the checkout, it'll basically say it's like, it will go back to the Aussie currency, but you'll then know how much US will be taken from your bank. So don't be put off by that at all. Um, but yeah, we, we, we ship all over. We, we actually, our biggest client in Australia was actually the Australian national soccer team. Um, we, we supplied them with glasses, um, 23 of them when they went over to play Honduras, um, their sports scientist actually um, asked me to write a paper for him on how to manage jet lag. And I didn't realize what it was for at the time. And then he read it and went, well, we need uh, 23 pairs of these then for our upcoming trip to Honduras. <laughs> so I was like, oh, brilliant. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, that was pretty cool. And yeah, we've, we've got, 
loads of different people sort of wearing the glasses. You know, um, Luke Story's got a pair as well. I know he also wears um, Matt's Matt's brand as well. So he, you know, he's open to both. And you know, there's lots. Bill Bill's tried ours and, and loves them. So you know, it's it's good. It's it's a good sort of family and a good um, sort of tribe to be involved with because it's not just you know everyone everyone buys these glasses off Amazon and gets a soulless package in the post and I know it because I recently took receipt of a lot of them to test and it's just this crunched up piece of rubbish in the, in the mail and you contact them and you get nothing back whereas you know people join our tribe and we got all the support in light and hell people are asking questions all the time how to wear them and you know one thing we do that's that's completely different to what anyone else does as well that i'd like to mention is our, our social responsibility in partnering with charity so we we actually um, partner with a, a charity called restoring vision over in california it's all on our website it's all on restoring visions website so it's an official partnership where every pair of glasses we sell we donate the monetary value to them to buy one pair of reading glasses to donate to someone in the developing world so like mexico guatemala pakistan india places like that um you know they, they've got a, a target to get 20 million pairs on um you know people that can't afford it by 2020 and we want to help to that so anyone that's actually you know protecting their health by using blue blocks buy one pair you know you're donating one pair to someone that you know maybe a mum that is sewing or using a sewing machine for a living and needs a pair of reading glasses but can't afford it um so can't provide for a family like you know by buying a pair of blue blocks you're absolutely optimizing your health in the best way because you're buying the best product out there but you're also then gifting back to someone in need and and you know that's so rewarding for um for, for someone and empowering for for also the person you're helping so you know I wish more companies would follow suit and, and partner with a charity. Andy, this has been an absolute pleasure, my friend. First off, I want to acknowledge you. I love the diligence that you do in verifying the quality of your product. A lot more of that is needed, particularly in the biohacking world. But this is uh, this is awesome. And you're an absolute wealth of information on this topic. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Andy. I really appreciate it. Awesome. It's been an absolute pleasure. And um, you know, even if one person listen to, listens to this and gets something out of it, job's done so you know must do this again sometime as well absolutely well to all the superhumans out there listening have an absolutely epic day superhumans before you go can i ask two favors did you enjoy that episode if so can you send me an email at podcast at decoding superhuman.com provide any feedback positive or negative i would love to hear from you and for those of you who have really taken advantage of that you know i respond to each email Secondly, if you did enjoy the episode, can you head on over to iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, any one of your favorite podcast listening platforms, and give Decoding Superhuman a five-star rating. It would really be appreciated. And then finally, for those of you who are looking at taking an informed approach to health, head on over to decodingsuperhuman.com. Check out what we have going on over there, and if you want to schedule a free 15-minute discovery call with me, you're going to have that option. Superhumans, have an absolutely epic day, and remember as always, choose health.